Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Amen. Let's do that this morning. Amen. Let's praise God this morning. I need your hands again. For this day, amen. I have. <laughs> I don't know about you.
praise you this morning. Amen. You are so, so wonderful. You are awesome, Lord. You are powerful. You are great. And that's all we can do this morning, Lord, is just praise your name. Lift you up to the nations, Lord. We worship you this morning. We worship you this morning. Sing it loud, amen. God, amen. A God who is great enough to create the world with a single word. A God who can breathe life into dust and you and I are created and formed in his image. So this morning we want to have a special time of prayer. A couple weeks ago, um, I wasn't here last week, I was at our district event and 
a couple of weeks, a couple of months before that, I was at a church service, and the pastor just began telling about all the miraculous things that God was doing in the church, and I just said, you know what? I want that in our church. Amen. I want that in our church. I want to. I just want to see the work of God moving consistently in our church. And so, what I'd like for you to do today, if you have a special need, it doesn't matter what it is. I mean, it could be something small. In your side, it could be something great in someone else's sight. But in the Lord's sight, there's no, there's no big and there's no small. I mean, it's, it's all the same. It's a need. And the Bible says that, that he's a good shepherd. And so when the shepherd puts the, peep, the sheep in the sheep pen, he, he looks over every sheep and he looks at them. And if there's an issue that they need to be taken care of, then the good shepherd, the Bible says, tends to the flock. So this morning, if you have an issue this morning and you'd like for us to pray with you, I'd like for our elders, some of our deacons to come forward. And, and we're just going to spend some time in prayer. Uh, so Pastor Bob, uh, some of our guys come forward. And we just want to take a moment. And if you're here this morning, you would say, you know, I, I just, I need a touch from the Lord. It doesn't matter what it is. You just need a little special prayer. As we continue to worship, as we continue to praise, let's just, let's come to the Lord. Can you? If you have a special need, let's sing. And all the earth will shout and praise, and our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Oh 
our hands together. Come on. Let's just take a moment and lift our hands. Father, Father, we magnify your name. We adore you. We give you honor and glory for there is none like you. There is none like you in heaven and earth. At the very mention of your name, every knee bows and every tongue confess that you are the Lord. We are your people. We are the sheep of your pasture. God, we thank you for the work of the cross. We thank you for what you're doing in us and through us this day. God, we dedicate ourselves to you. We give ourselves to you in humble submission to you. Declare that we're your people. We'll follow where you lead us. We'll go. We'll do what you ask us to do. That you are a holy God. And do a work inside of us today, God. Do a do a a transformative work inside of us today. Change us from who we are to who you want us to be. Change us from who we have been to the person you created us to fulfill our mission and our purposes. God, will be quick to give you really all the glory and the honor for it is due unto you. We thank you for it. Thank you for your presence that we sense here today. In your name we pray, and everybody said, amen. God bless you, amen. We're going to take a moment and greet one another, and so if you haven't, uh, you know, there's plenty of seats today. It's summer, right? Come on. It's summer, so you got the pick of the seats today. Uh, make sure you greet one another. Let everybody know we're glad you're here, and then we'll come back. God bless you. Thank you, guys. Just before we go any further with our service, um, I just want to take a moment to just say something. For those of you that don't know, this is actually going to be my last day with the church. And just over some time about thinking and praying about what was next for me, I felt like the Lord kind of led me to that this season was over and I was ready to step into the next season. And as I was here today on the last day, honestly, I was thinking about my first day of all, of all things on my last day. And I was thinking about the day that I first got introduced to each and every one of you from up here. And I remember saying a specific statement, and it was that the best is yet to come. And obviously, I know that, I know that there's been some challenges here with this church recently. There's been some transitions. And I know even to a degree, 
there's some uncertainty about what's next for the church. And as I'm standing here today on my last day, just like my first day, I genuinely believe that the best is still yet to come. And I'm praying for this church, for our opportunity to reach this community, and for each and every one of you as individuals, that the best will come and that the best is yet to come. And I'm confident in this, just like Paul says in Philippians 1, because I'm confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And I'm thankful for this opportunity that I had to serve this church, to help this church move forward. And again, I'm praying for blessings and for the best for each and every one of you here and for the future of this church. And again, I'm thankful for this opportunity that I had to be here and praying for the best for each and every one of you. Thank you and God bless. God. Amen. Amen. Well, I will tell you, Kelly will be missed. We're just believing that God has something in store for him. Kelly, could I get you just come up here? Could I get Pastor Bob and Pastor Tino? Um, and you guys are ministers. And Tramel, Tramel is a church planter, uh, is going to be planting a church in this area uh, in the next couple of months. And so can we just pray for, can we just pray for Kelly? Can we just can we just take a moment? Can you just extend your hands toward Kelly? And let's just pray a blessing over him. Father, God, we thank you for the call of God that is really evident upon Kelly's life. And God, we bless him. And God, we ask that you would open a door for him that no man can shut. God, you have been faithful. He has been faithful serving us here at this church. He's given his time and effort and his abilities. And God, as this next season of ministry happens... God, I pray that you would just use him in a way that he's never been used before. God, I pray that this next door of opportunity would be a door of opportunity that he sees, he understands, and he will be able to walk through. And God, I pray the anointing of the Holy Spirit rests upon Pastor Kelly. Use this young man who's dedicated his life, who's following the call of God. Use him to do great things. In your name we pray. Amen, 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 amen. Listen, we're just believing that God's going to do some great things in Pastor Kelly. And someday we'll look back and we'll see him someplace and we'll go, you know, where he got started. We taught him everything he knows, right? I mean, we, we taught him everything he knows. So we're very excited about Pastor Kelly. And I want to do two things real quick. Number one, I, I want us to receive our offering Oh, there you are. Uh, I want us to receive our offering today, and you'll notice on the screen that we have a couple of ways that you can give. Uh, number one, thank you for your faithfulness. You know, I have been here 20 weeks today. Today's my 20th anniversary, 20th week anniversary, and, uh, and I have yet to take a special offering, right? I've yet to take a special offering because can I tell you why? Because of your faithfulness. I, I go to a lot of churches and as an interim, and sometimes I have to take a special offering to make the mortgage. Sometimes you've got to go to a church, and you've got to take a special offering to pay the light bill. But can I say, because of your faithfulness and because of your consistency and your dedication to the principles of the Scripture and believing in, in tithing, that this church is financially blessed. I mean, this church is financially blessed, and I want to... I want to just remind you that it's not because, can I tell you, it's not because we have some fat, rich cat. I mean, some of us are fat, but we're not that rich, and we're not a cat. But listen, it's because of your faithfulness. Can I, can I just kind of chronicle through a couple things real quick? Number one, because of your faithfulness, we have a new digital sign that's going to be put up on July the 17th. It costs us about $48,000. Come on. Uh, and because of your faithfulness, we haven't had to take a special offering. Because of your faithfulness, we put furniture in the foyer. It cost us about ten dollars or $12,000. Didn't have to take a special offering. Why? Because of your faithfulness. We put security doors into our new children's department area. And that was about $24,000. And guess what? We didn't have to take an offering. Why? Because of your faithfulness in giving. Uh, if you haven't seen, our children's area just got repainted this week. This next week, new carpet's going in. About $20,000 we put into there. And we've not had to take a special offering. Why? Because of your faithfulness. Today after church, our sound team is 
tearing things up and we're putting in a new sound system. Why? We're paying for it cash. How are we able to do that? Not by taking a special offering, but because of your faithfulness. Listen, I, I just want to thank you for that. I, I want to tell you that, that you're blessed and we are blessed. We have no lack. We have no shortage because of our faithfulness. Your faithfulness to God and God's faithfulness back to us. Amen? So we got some new things coming, some great things are going to be in store for us. But we want to thank you for that. Now, I want to tell you, I do want to take a special offering right now. Right? So we're going to take our regular tithes and offerings, and I have two envelopes. I've got one over here that says my tithe, and then I've got another one. And we would like to send Pastor Kelly out, and so we want to bless him on the way out. Amen? I believe the issue that if we honor and if we bless, God blesses us, right? So I want to encourage you to take your checkbook out, reach into that part of your wallet where you've got that $100 bill or you've got that $50 bill or whatever. You know, some of you may have a, a bigger denomination than I have, but uh, take that out. And we want to bless Pastor Kelly on the way out. So I've got a special offering for Pastor Kelly and I've got a special, my regular tithes and offerings. And we just want to bless him and we want to say thank you. But listen, we want to bless him on the way out so that God's hand continues to rest upon us. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we love you today. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for the work of God in us. God, I thank you for this church that has a heritage and a lineage of being men and women who are faithful in returning back to you the tithe and the offering. And your word says that you have opened the windows of heaven. And God, we are a recipient of the blessings of God in this church family. And God, as we move forward, we just ask that as we continually, faithfully serve you, that you will continue to bless us, not only with financial blessings, but God, more than anything else, God, we pray for souls for the kingdom of God. God, we pray that this building would be full. We pray that these seats will be filled. And God, we ask that you would work in us and through us to accomplish that. In your precious name we pray. And everybody said, amen. God bless you, gentlemen. Uh, as we all give. So glad you are here today. We are starting second week in a sermon series on the life of Samson. And I normally stay around and I'm usually one of the last guys out the door. But after the service, I've got to drive down to Bryan College Station and meet with the church board uh, and help them deal with an issue that we've been dealing with. And I'm going to be meeting with them today at, four, uh, today at 4.30. And so if I could... Uh, ask for one favor. Today about 4.30, if my, my name or my picture or my name or something just drops into your heart about 4.30, would you just say a prayer for me? Because I'm really going into a really tough situation this afternoon that, that um, the devil has just tried to destroy a church. Just tried to destroy a church. And uh, I'm going to go down there today and meet with the church board and try to help them out. So really appreciate your prayers. We're, we're in a sermon series on the life of Samson. And, and how many know the story of Samson? Come on, we all know the story of Samson. We know the story of Samson's great feats of strength. Uh, we know that, that God blessed him with incredible 
potential. And yet in spite of all that divine potential and divine strength and power, we have to ask the question we asked last week was this. What makes strong men weak? What is it that in spite of the power, in spite of the divine anointing, how does man who has all of that, who is such so strong, how do they become weak? I think that's a question we can ask ourselves too. I mean, we look around at our lives and we see that we have the potential that God has placed within us and God has put his divine blessing and his favor upon us. But how do we as strong people of God, how do we get tripped up? The Bible says in Samson's life, he was raised as a Nazarite. And as a Nazarite, he made some vows that he would not touch alcohol, that he would, that he would not shave his head, that he wouldn't touch any deadly thing, anything that was dead. But yet, in the life of Samson, we see that he broke every vow that he ever made to God. Last week in our first sermon on this topic, we talked about that there are three attitudes that Samson had that really made him, who was once strong, we made him weak, and the first was lust. The Bible says that he went down into Timnah, and he married a woman who the Bible says was completely off limits to him, but he said, I want her. And I want her now. The second attitude that we saw last week was the, the, the attitude of entitlement. He broke his Nazarite vow by touching a, you remember the story? He killed the lion and he came back a couple of days later, a couple of weeks later. And, and inside the lion there was, there was a honeycomb and he reached down inside the, ca- the, the, the carcass. That's the word I'm looking for. The carcass of the dead lion and scooped out the honeycomb and he touched the dead thing and he broke his vow. The third attitude that we see in Samson's life was an attitude of pride. Attitude of pride. The Bible says he wasn't supposed to touch any alcohol, but he had a bachelor's party, and he threw himself a kegger with the Philistines because he thought he could handle it. And so we watched last week as we saw this young, strong man become very, very weak, Today, I want us also to talk about another one of his vulnerabilities, how that strong men become weak. In fact, I believe it's an issue that every one of us in this room, whether you're male or female, deal with. And right up front, I'm going to be straightforward with you. I want to give you the biggest takeaway from today's message. It says on the screen that this, Samson followed his emotions instead of following the Spirit of God. How do you take strong people and make them weak? By following your emotions and not following the Spirit of God. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, most of us men, we don't think we're very emotional, right? I mean, who's emotional? Women are emotional, not men. I mean, men, come on. We're the strong, silent type. So my wife says, you don't have a heart. I go, yes, I do. I just don't feel it very often, right? Men, we need to recognize that emotions are not bad. In fact, God created emotions. The real issue is this, that emotions are not bad for us as long as we are not led and we don't always follow our emotions. The reality is this, that if you look at men and women, we process emotions completely different. You know how my wife processes emotions? If my wife, you haven't, you've only met my wife a couple of times, but... Uh, My wife, when she processes emotions, if she's really upset, you know what she'll do? She'll call her friend Sue, and she'll say, Sue, why don't you come over to the house? We'll sit at the couch, and we'll drink some tea, and we'll talk. Listen, I need to let you know, I have never had a dude call me and say, Hey, Mike, you want to come over to the house? Sit on the couch, we'll drink some tea, and we'll talk. I just want to let you know, if you do that to me, we're not going to be friends anymore. That's just not the way guys deal with issues. See, generally, the way men deal with emotions is we don't want to talk. We prefer to do what? Act. Act. Here's the problem. It says on the screen, when we follow our emotions, instead of following the Spirit of God, we find ourselves beginning to do things 
that we regret. Come on, anybody know what I'm talking about? Doing things that you regret, okay? Now, I'm, I'm just going to be really honest with you. Two, three weeks ago, I'm driving home from church. I get on 360. <clears throat> as soon as I pull on, on the access road, these three young boys just cut me off. And, and so I did what every man does. I just kind of tapped my horn a little bit because I'm like, come on. And so they proceeded to slow down and roll down the windows and began to flip me off, shoot me the bird. And I just want to let you know that if you're going to flip me off and shoot me the bird, uh, you need to know that I, I kind of got a little bit, I got a little bit mad. And in fact, for a few moments, I forgot that I was a Christian. I, I forgot that I was a pastor, and I certainly forgot that I'm 62 years old. So they start flipping me off, so I roll down my window. I'm not going to flip them off, but I'm going to talk to them, right? And about the time I pulled up to them to tell them, let's stop that behavior, they just floored their car and took off, so guess what I did? I, I floored my Chevy pickup truck, and then we're cruising down 360 at about 95 miles an hour. We're zigging, zagging. Come on. I, I, I told you I forgot I was a Christian, right? We're zigging and we're zagging all through traffic. And, and uh, I, mean, I mean, I'm just like uh, another guy flips me off, and I'm like, I'll deal with you later. I'm dealing with these guys first, right? And so we're just dealing with this, and, and I, I, I am just, we're flying down the highway and I'm just right on their bumper. And I am mad. Come on. Come on. Don't look at me like that. I'm, I'm madder than a hornet. And we're just right on their bumper. And then suddenly, about 95 miles an hour, I had this realization. You know what? There's only a couple of ways this could play out. Number one, I could pull them over and beat the snot out of them. And then I'd be on the news. Right? Number two... I could pull them over. They could beat the snot out of me, and that's really embarrassing. Number three, I could get a speeding ticket. Number four, I could cause an accident. But I want to let you know that none of those things slowed me down. It wasn't until the fifth option hit my head, and I realized, oh, my Lord. What if someone sees me and recognizes me and tells my wife? Because then you just don't know how much trouble I would really be in. And so at the thought of having to deal with my wife, I, I slowed down. You see, when you follow your emotions, when you follow your emotions instead of following the Spirit of God, you find yourselves doing things that you regret. That's why Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, verses 15, 16 and 17, that I say, live by the what? Spirit. And if you live by the Spirit, you will not fulfill, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For your sinful nature, these emotions, these things that you want, are contrary to the law of God. You see, the problem that we see in, most, in Samson's life and in our life as well is that sometimes we end up living lives led by our emotions instead of the Spirit of God. And we see this played out in Samson's life over and over and over again. First of all, he marries a Philistine. He fall, first of all, he falls in love with a Philistine woman. He violates the very thing that God told all the children of Israel. Don't marry people who worship other gods. Samson says, I, I don't care what God says. I don't care what my parents say. I don't care what my Nazarite vow says. I want to do what I want to do. So it says he goes four miles down into the enemy's territory into a town called Timna, and at his bachelor's party he has a kegger because his fiance is a Philistine. So he leaves behind whose people? His people. And he spends all of his time in the land of the Philistines. So he's hanging out with the Philistines, who are what? Their enemy. He's hanging out with them. He's spending time with them. And here's what happened when a bunch of guys start spending time together. You know what they do? Samson says, hey, I got this great idea. Why don't we have a little competition? Because that's what guys do. Samson says, why don't we have a battle of our wits? And let's put a, let's put a wager on it. Because 
That's what guys do. I mean, if we're just going to hang around, we're not going to sit on the couch and drink tea. We're going to say, I bet I can throw this rock. What? Come on, all the men in the house. I bet I can throw this rock further than you can throw that rock. I bet I can make more baskets than you can make. Why? Because if there's a bunch of guys to round together in a little bit, can I tell you it's going to become competitive, right? And so Samson says, let's have a little bit of competition and let's raise the ante. <clears throat> so the Bible says that Samson makes the stupidest bet that anyone could ever make. It says in verse number, chapter 14, verses 12 and 13, it says on the screen that Samson says, I bet you 30 garments of clothing. I bet you 30 complete outfits that I can beat you. And then Samson gives us a riddle, and he says, this riddle is so good, I bet you in seven days you cannot fulfill the riddle. Here's what the riddle says in verse number 14. It says, out of the eater, something to eat. Out of the strong, something sweet. Now, we know what that's all about. Remember the story earlier that Samson had coming down to Tim and he killed the lion with his bare hands. He comes back and he, he finds this sweet honeycomb inside of the dead carcass. The verse says that for three days, the enemies of God, the Philistines, who he's now trying to become friends with, they struggle to figure out the, the riddle. And these guys become furious. And then it says in verse number 15, Finally, on the fourth day, they go to the woman that Samson is about to marry, and they say to her, hey, whatever you have to do, you better figure out the answer to this riddle, because if you don't figure it out, we're going to come back, and what are we going to do? We're going to take you and your father, we're going to burn everything you own to the ground, and we're going to burn you to death. Verse number 16, the Bible says that Samson's wife, that he's a fiance, they pledged to, she pulls out the greatest weapon that every woman has in her arsenal. What does she begin to do? The Bible says she began crying. I don't know. Does it work on you? Works on me. The Bible says she starts sobbing. She says, you, you really don't love me. You just act like you love me. Because if you really loved me, you would tell me the secret to this riddle. And Samson says, hey, baby, I love you. But I've not even told my parents. And the Bible says for seven days. How many days? Seven days she bawled and squalled asking her, him to give her the solution. And but finally... Verse number 17, after seven days of weeping and gnashing and wailing of teeth, Samson relents and gives her the answer to the riddle. And guess what she does? Immediately, she heads out the back door and gives the answers to the men who have threatened her. Look at verse number 18. It says, before sunset on the seventh day, the men of the town said to him, Samson, what is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? The Bible says that Samson becomes furious. He's embarrassed. And in verse number 18, he says one of the stupidest things that a man could ever say about a woman. He says, guys, if you hadn't plowed with my heifer, come on. If you hadn't plowed with my heifer, you would have never discovered this rental. Two lessons you need to learn from verse number 18. Number one, men, never let anybody else plow with your wife. And number two, don't ever call your wife a heifer. And all the ladies said, amen. amen. See, again, we see that Samson's being led by his emotion and said by the Spirit of God. And when we live a life led by our emotions, you just need to know that it leads you to some pretty dark places where you begin to do some things that you shouldn't do. And we see that Samson begins to cave in to these emotions, and he begins to get weaker and weaker. 
We see him fall victim to his emotions. And that's how strong men become weak. Here's the first emotion that Samson fell prey to. Number one in your outline, it says this. Samson burned with anger. I just, I just want to lift my hands and say, I can relate to Samson. Anybody here? Come on. Anybody here? Got enough testosterone that you say? Come on. Anybody here have an anger issue beside me? Yeah, I do. Yeah. If you don't believe me, just pull out in front of me in the parking lot. Let's see what happens, right? I, 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 have, I have an issue, and Samson has an issue with anger. It says in verse 19 that Samson went down to Eshkelon. In other words, Scripture says that he goes down to a different town and he kills 300 guys just for their clothes. He kills 300 guys just for their clothes. And he gives the clothes to the people just to satisfy the bet. The Bible says, burning with anger, look at it, burning with anger, he went to his father's house and Samson's wife was given to a friend who attended the wedding instead of him. Now, what are you thinking? Wait, 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 wait what, what, what happened here? I, I don't understand. I thought that was his wife. Well, let me explain it to you. The Bible says that these guys figured out through trickery Samson's riddle, and he becomes furious. So before he goes to, before he actually gets married, in the middle of the ceremony, Samson leaves and go kills 300 guys. He takes their clothing and pays off his debt. And while this is happening, the father of the bride, he's embarrassed. I mean, he, he's reserved the room. He's decorated everything. And, and his wife is kind of jilted standing at the altar. And there's a custom of the day that says, if, if your daughter is of marrying age and if the, if the groom doesn't show up and if there's an available suitor in the room who's appropriate, then you can go ahead and give your daughter away in marriage. That's what he did. So the father of the bride gives Samson's bride to another man. And Samson comes back from his killing spree. He's already angry. And now the woman that he's supposed to marry is married to another guy. And the Bible says that Samson becomes unhinged. He's completely furious. Now look what he does in, in chapter 15, verses 4 and 5. The Bible says that he goes and he catches 300 foxes. Now, that in itself is an amazing feat, right? I mean, where do you, what are you going to do with them? How, how are you going to catch them? I mean, have you ever seen a wild fox try to get caught? I mean, I, I, it's, it's unbelievable. But the Bible says he caught 300 wild foxes. He ties them together by their tail he puts on the rope, he puts a torch, and he releases these 300 foxes into the land of the Philistines. And the Bible says that they burned down all of their crops, all of their wheats, all of their grains, all of their olive gardens. Because of this, the Bible says the Philistines, they are now outraged. And again, what happens? The Bible says in verse number 6 that the Philistines, whose lands have just been destroyed, what do they do? They go and find the woman that Samson was supposed to marry. They find her and her husband, her and her father. They burned their house down, and they burned them alive. Now, again, we find Samson in a place where he's driven by his emotions. We find Samson living a life where he's his his emotions lead him down a pathway of being self-destructive again and again. Now, I, I don't know if this resonates with you, but I just want to tell you that there's been a lot of times in my life where I have found myself following my emotions instead of the Spirit of God, and I have experienced destruction in my life because of it. How about you? Let's just pause just for a second. And can we think about all of the things that led up to Samson's irrational rage? Just think about this. Samson was the one who went down into the Philistine territory. Samson was the one who pursued the wrong woman. Samson was the one who decided to marry the Philistine woman. He was the one 
who taunted the Philistines with the riddle. He was the one who set the terms of the bet. Samson was the one who only knew the secret to the riddle. Samson was the one who gave away the secret to the riddle. Samson was the one who left his bride at the altar. Hear me. I believe that's the way some of us live when it comes to anger. We're so angry at the world when in reality we should be angry with ourselves. We're so angry at everybody else. Oh, I hate my job. I, I hate my boss. When in reality, maybe you didn't finish trade school. Maybe in reality, you didn't finish college. Maybe, maybe you took a job that was below your potential. The truth is, maybe you're mad at yourself, but you're taking it out on everyone else talk to people all the time and they say, Mike, I, I'm just so angry with God. I just don't understand how God could lead me here. I don't, I don't understand how that it, it's like, it's like God's not answering my prayers anymore. It's like God has turned his face against me and he's silent toward me. Mike, I'm going through all these troubles. I'm going through all these calamities. But maybe the reality is this. It's been your unwise decisions that have put you in this place to begin with. Maybe it hasn't been God that's led you there. Maybe the reality is that you've led yourself there. Maybe you're there because you've led yourself there and what you need to do is just own it. Because maybe you've been led by your emotions and seen being led by the Spirit of God. You see, when you and I begin to be led by the Spirit of God, excuse me, when we ignore being led by the Spirit of God, we find ourselves in a place where it always brings destruction to our lives. So my prayer today is this, that there would be men all over this building who would rise up and say, with the help of the Lord and with the help of some of my friends, I'm going to ask for forgiveness. And I, I, want, I want to say to my kids, I want you to forgive me for the way I've been acting towards you as a father. You deserve a better father than I have been to you. I'm sorry for yelling at you. I'm sorry for blowing it. I'm, I'm just sorry for letting my anger spew on you. And from this day forward, I want to be the father that you need. I, I, I'm praying that there are men all over this building who will go to their wives and say, Baby, I'm sorry that I haven't treated you with honor and respect. From now on, I'm going to care and provide and protect you. I'm going to be the man that I should have been all along. I'm going to be the husband that you need me to be. I'm not going to be the man anymore who's been led by my emotions, but I want to be led by the Spirit of God. And ladies, can I ask you to do something for me? When your husband comes and says those kinds of things, when your father comes and says those kinds of things, can you not be a jerk, loser woman? Don't, don't be a jerk. Don't, don't be a loser. Don't jab at him and say, well, I've been waiting. Can I tell you what you can do? Would you embrace him? Would you love him? Because here's what I know. You can either love your husband up to God or you can tear him down. And if you tear him down enough times, can I tell you what he will do? He will take his ball and go play in another court. True. Ladies, I want you to know that your words are not inconsequential in the lives of your husband. Your words are powerful. I, I was thinking, what's a better word than powerful? And I, I want to say this. Your words are nuclear. Your words do something inside the heart of your man, and you have no idea the strength, the encouragement, 
that your simple words make. Here's a second emotion that makes strong man weak. It's this. Samson was filled with pride. Samson was filled with pride. Look at verse number 15. It says, and finding a fresh jawbone of a donkey. Just stop right there. A fresh jawbone means that it hadn't been dead very long. And remember, as a Nazarite, Samson was not allowed to touch anything that was what? Dead. So he breaks his vow again. Look what he does. The Bible says that he picks up the jawbone of the donkey. And the Bible says that he kills a thousand men. Then look what he does. Samson begins to take credit for what he has just done. Look at verse number 16. Samson says these words. With the donkey's bone, I have made a blank of them. It starts with an A and it's got a couple of S's in it. Now, the Bible translator here is being sweet and being kind. But he's, he's making a pun here. With the donkey, I made a blank of these guys. And with a jawbone, I have killed a thousand men. Can you see the pride in his life? Can you see the arrogance, the raw pride in his life? He's saying, look at me. Look how strong I am. Look how powerful I am. What I've learned about those kind of people is this, that pride is born out of insecurity. The most prideful people that I know are the most insecure people that I know. Why? Because they don't know who they are in Christ. They don't know who they are as a believer. And so pride is the first thing that begins to swell up and rise up in their life and it makes them weak. That's why 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 and 6 says that God does what? He resists, come on, he resists the proud. But what does he do? He gives grace to the humble. Therefore, do what? Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you when? In due time. Can I tell you the phrase that's the problem here? In due time. That's the problem with the person who has pride. He doesn't want it tomorrow. He doesn't want it down the road. When does he want it? Right now. Look at me now. Look at all the great things that I've done now. Look at all of my accomplishments now. Look how cool I am now. Look how talented I am right now. Look at all the money that I've made. Look at everything that I've built. Look at all my accomplishments and pride. Pride. It's pride. And here's what I know about people that are prideful, particularly men. It says on the screen that most men want to be the main character in the story. It's true. Most men, we want to be the main character in the story. We want everything to be about who? Us. I want to win so I can be proud. And if I lose, I get angry. When the reality is this, you need to know that you and I were never designed by God to be the main character in the story of our life. The Bible says that God and God alone is always the main character in our story. And if you are constantly driven by your emotions, you're going to end up just like Samson, a man who had great strength, a person who had great potential, but you're consistently getting into patterns of self-destructive behavior. The Bible says that if you put yourself, if you put your emotions on the altar and say, God, not my will, but your will be done. Lord, I don't want to be led by my emotions any longer. I don't want to be led by my feelings. Lord, I want to be led by the Spirit of God. Then all of a sudden, can I tell you what happens? God becomes the main character of the story instead of you. And when you no longer 
have a desire to be the main character in the story, and you begin to stop living for the approval of other people in your life, suddenly you find yourself living a life with an audience of one in mind. And that audience is the audience of God. And when you live a life where you're only concerned about what God wants to do in and through you, suddenly he begins to use you. He can use you in ways that you never thought imaginable. Can I, can I just be honest with you? When I look out over this crowd every Sunday morning and Wednesday night, I, I, I see such greatness. I see such potential for greatness inside of you. I see the potential for men to be the men that God intended them to be. To be the husband that God intended them to be. To man of integrity who in the business world doesn't cheat, doesn't lie, doesn't steal, but operates in integrity. To be men who love their wife as Christ loved the church and gives himself for her. To be the kind of men who defends those who cannot defend themselves. To be the kind of men who impart spiritual wisdom and integrity and knowledge into the next generation. That's the kind of people that God wants us to be. And I've had enough conversations with some of you to know that, that when I start talking like that, in the back of your mind, you begin to disqualify yourself from accomplishing the, those things. Because maybe you think, well, Mike, if you, if you only knew what I've done in the dark, if she knew, if he knew, if they knew, if everybody knew what I've done in my past, nobody would ever trust me ever again. Mike, I, I failed God so many, many times before. I, I just can't tell you how many times, Mike, that I feel like I've just, I've just disappointed God over and over again. And Mike, if you knew that about me, you wouldn't be saying those things. Can I, can I just, can I want you to hear something from me with all of my heart? The Bible says that in spite of what you have done, who you may have done it with, and what the condition of your heart may have been at that point in time, the Bible says if you will humble yourself, and if you will come before the Lord, and if you will admit your weakness, the Bible says, if you lay before yourself before him, God will do a transformative work in your life. And if you don't believe me, let's finish the rest of the story with Samson. Here's the third thing. Number three, Samson found himself in great need. Verse number 18 says, after all of the killing, after all of the catching of the animals, after all the stuff that Samson's been through, the Bible says that he was very thirsty. Can I just tell you something? If you will let your need drive you to God, God will meet your greatest need. Listen, if you will let your need drive you to God, God will meet your greatest need. Notice what Samson says in this verse. It says, and Samson did what? He cried out to the Lord. Notice, now there's no pride in his life. Samson's now humble. Samson says, God, you gave me, your servant, this great victory. And now I must die of thirst in the hands of the land of the uncircumcised. And verse number 18, verse number 19, the Bible says, And God opened up a hollow place in the rock, and water flowed from it. In other words, when, God, when Samson humbled himself before God, when he acknowledged his pride and said, God, I can't do any of this without you, the Bible says that God performed a miracle in his life. Why? Because you and I were never designed to be the main character in the story. It's always supposed to be about God and God alone. Here's what you need to see. 
Miracles will happen in your life. Listen to me. Miracles will happen into your life in abundance when you allow God to be the main character of the story of your life. The next verse says this. And water came out from the rock, and Samson did what? The Bible says he drank. Verse number 19 says on the screen. And when Samson drank, what does the verse say? His strength returned, and he was revived. Can I tell you, when you and I return to God, our strength is revived. When you and I return to God, our vision is revived. Our clarity is revived. When we return to God, all of a sudden, God begins to pour into those crevices of our life that are filled with weakness he begins to pour himself into those weak spots we hear him say to our heart we hear him say to our our life you can live again you can make a difference again you can lead again you can be the man that god designed you to be you can be the woman that god designed you to be if you will just humble yourself under the right hand of God and allow God to do something inside of you that you cannot do for yourself. Why? Because God wants to be the center of your story. That's what the whole story of Samson is all about. It's about a narcissist. Come on, do this, do this with me. Come on. It's about a narcissist. Come on. It's about people like you and I who want the story to be about us. Come on, how do you know you're that way? Well, when someone else tells a story about something they did, what do you do? you got to tell them a story about what you did. Because you want the whole conversation to be about who? You. The devil is completely satisfied with you living a life believing that you are the center of the world. When in reality, God says, if you'll let me be the center of the story, I can do great and mighty things in you, and I can do great and mighty things through you. Let's bow our heads. Father, I have preached to Mike Harper today. I've just, this message convicts me. As I pray, it convicts other people who have a tendency to allow themselves to be the center of the story rather than allowing you to be the center of the story. And I pray this day that that this would be a church that even though they're great in giving of finances, they're great in attendance. But God, there's this little kingdom of self that still wants to control things, wants to be in charge. God, I pray that this morning that your word through the life of Samson would help us see the folly and the foolishness of trying to believe that life revolves around us when in reality, you are the center of the world. All things are made by you. All things are held together by him. Everything that is, is because of you. And God, I ask this morning, that we would be people who would humble ourselves before God. Say, not my will, but thy will be done. It's not what I want. It's not what I want to do. It's not all the things and the plans that I have for me. But God, I humble myself before you. And I want to be led by the Spirit of God. 
this morning, if that's you and you would say, you know what, Mike? I'm going to lift my hand with you because I have a tendency to try to lead me. I have a tendency to try to lead me. And I don't want to be led by me anymore. I want to be led by the Spirit of God. If that's you, would you lift your hand with me? Yes, sir, I see that. Yeah, yeah, thanks, guys. Thank you. I see that. Yeah, thank you. Father, we want to be led by you. This morning, I I don't know any other way of, of closing out this service than simply saying, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. By simply saying, would you come to the altar? If you want to crucify yourself, if you want to crucify that part of your life, would you just come to the altar and have a moment with God and allow God to touch you? Can he touch you there? Yeah, he can touch you there. But I'm telling you, if you'll come to the altar, if you'll humble yourself, he'll touch you in a deeper, deeper way. So if you'd like to come to the altar and seal this sermon with a prayer, seal it in your heart and say, God, that's what I want. I I want my life to be dedicated to you, that I hear your voice and I follow your voice rather than follow the things of my heart. Would you come? Father, we thank you today. God, we thank you for this message that pierces our heart. God, as we leave today and as we go spend time with our family God would our conversations around our lunch table differ today that we talk about what it looks like for God to be the center of our marriage to be the center of our child rearing to be the center of our business to be the center of our life and we give you the throne of our heart we give you the throne of our marriage of our kids and our finances in our careers and we say not our will but your will be done in your name we pray and everybody said amen if you'd like to come and just seal this prayer time God bless you we'll see you Wednesday night at our Bible study at 7 o'clock sharp we spend time in prayer leads in a prayer model God bless you if you want to come pray be sure to come